We're here at the 15th Annual Asian Film Festival of Dallas, here with the filmmakers behind Finding Cleveland. Uh, Larissa, tell us uh, who you are. Well, my name is Larissa Lam. I am the director and composer for Finding Cleveland. I'm from Los Angeles, California, and this is actually my documentary directing debut. So let's, um, let's kind of jump, before we jump into this wonderful documentary, right. the debut, um, I feel kind of weird because you're so good at interviewing people yourself. I've got to ask, uh, in your past, right. who are some of the f people that you loved interviewing the most? What are some of the fun stories you have? My favorite interview of all time is I used to host a talk show uh, for a network called Juice, and Mr. T was my guest. And I love this man. He comes on, and you know, we've had, a, we've had athletes, celebrities, authors, all sorts of people on our show. And Mr. T, you know, he's like big time. He's an icon, you know? And he comes in, and we were running a little behind schedule, and so we're like, you know, Mr. T, if we need to do your interview first before we do our other segments, um, let us know. We can do that. And he says, you know what T stands for? T stands for time. And I got all the time in the world. I carved up the whole day. I didn't schedule anything else. I'm like, oh, that's 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 really sweet of you. Because I mean, you know, we've had so many people that are like they're they're running from interview to interview, and the fact that he actually he actually set aside the whole day to like be interviewed by us. Um, I just thought that just showed his humility and he had no entourage at all and, and he can talk your ear off about everything. I think I learned I think I learned his whole life's history even before the interview. <laughs> but he was the sweetest guy. I, I, I will always remember that day. That's so cool. Yeah. The A team service for Mr. T. Yeah, no, yeah, I love him. I, I love that guy. But no, let's let's jump into this documentary. Okay. How did how did this story come about and, and um, I guess introduce Baldwin as well to kind of give the full background of, yeah. of you two. Um, so Baldwin Chu, um, who is actually my husband, um, at AKA Only One, the rapper, um, you know, both of us are both music artists, you know, by trade. And um, so for us to do this documentary was kind of a, a new thing. Um, and Baldwin um, was born in San Francisco um, and his, his father came from China um, to San Francisco, but what he grew up never knowing was his grandfather. Um, all he knew is at some point later on in his life, he knew his grandfather was buried in Mississippi. And so, um, you know, we just thought we'd take a family trip uh, his brother actually suggested, hey, let's do a trip to Mississippi just to visit Grandpa's grave. We've never been there. Maybe Dad would like to go there. Uh, and it took several years of coaxing my, my father-in-law to go. But finally, um, two years ago, we went to Cleveland, Mississippi. I honestly thought we were going to find one grave of one Chinese guy. And I guess it was his great-grandfather. So two Chinese guys, like, in Mississippi. And lo and behold, when we get there, we end up discovering there was a whole population of Chinese people. Um, that were very integral to the population, you know, of the South when you normally think of it as black and white. And and so that began our journey into making this film, um, which documents the 48 hours that we were there and some of the events and the things. And I don't want to give too much away, but basically there's a lot of surprising revelations that, that happened when we went out there. How, how cathartic was this experience for you guys as a family? And especially for Baldwin, I mean, learning this very much for the first time. Yeah, I would say that it was an incredibly cathartic experience, um, especially for his father. Um, one for Baldwin, I think he and his father have always come to odds in certain things. I think the culture class of him being born here, his father you know, being or born overseas, especially um, I think Baldwin had a much better understanding of his father because he never talked about his his own you know, father um, feeling abandoned by his father as, as a, ch you know, a child. And um, I think he's always been very insular about his family, very untrusting of other people. And I think a lot of those things were rooted in the fact that um, he had a hard life when he first came here and just kind of blamed his father for like having abandoned him and so in that sense it can get pulled him closer together because um, you know he had a better understanding and for my father-in-law Charles um, I think again I don't want to give too many surprises but it was so th cathartic and in, in knowing a lot finding out a lot more about his his father I think in some ways it doesn't replace all those years he never knew his father but from our trip and what we uncovered about his his father you know we he was a good man you know you guys are, are you guys live out in LA you guys yes. are Californians I'm I'm curious when you first went out to to Cleveland what was it like Visually, I mean, for us, we get to see it, but what was it like seeing it? Because it is, 
it's a, it's a different type of culture completely. Yeah, I, I mean, one question we get a lot when we've been doing screenings of, of our film is, especially on the on the you know on the the different coasts, right, um, east and west coast, is people always have us like, oh my gosh, you guys are Chinese, you're going to the south. They're thinking all these rednecks rednecks are going to like lynch us or something. <laughs> like, what's the reaction? And honestly, we felt very welcomed, you know. Um, and if, if anything, they didn't look at us like, oh, here's Chinese. We were the Californians. That was actually the otter part, like you mentioned, being Cal California. And that was the really the thing that people were like, oh my gosh, there's a family from California here looking for their grandfather's grave. You know what I mean? And, and everybody was so helpful and everybody really wanted to help us. And, and, and it was almost like finding long lost family is what it felt like. Because there was that connection when they found out that Baldwin's family, you know, was in Mississippi. Everybody just welcomed them with open arms. You know, I was amazed at, at how how much you pack in these 48 hours. There's a lot that goes on. Um, and, and you guys have been recognized for this. This is an award-winning documentary already. Yes. Um, can you talk about so far the, the festival journey mm -hmm. you guys have been on and, and maybe even starting like back at Oxford and right. I think Baldwin was just in Sacramento? He was. Um, he's actually been to Sacramento twice um, and I was in DC Film Festival and we've been to I think 10 f festivals. I think this is either this is either our 10th or 11th here in Dallas um, and when we were at Oxford um, we were there in February and Oxford, Mississippi. It was the first time we screened it in Mississippi, kind of for you know a local crowd, and we just were so amazed of the support that we got. We ended up winning Best Documentary um, out there for Mississippi, and um, even to this day, like it was so funny. We were at the awards ceremony, and our our, our film's called Finding Cleveland, right? And so once we they announced our name, you know, one of our new friends, another filmmaker, was like, "Cleveland rocks, Cleveland." Rocks. <laughs> as Baldwin's going up on stage to accept the award. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we just had a lot of congratulations. Um, and as a result of the, of the Oxford Film Festival, our film is actually going to be shown on PBS later this fall in Mississippi. So that's pretty exciting. And we won, like, free rental equipment for... Um, we're making a second documentary um, expanding on the story. So we're going to be going back to Mississippi. So that free rental camera equipment is going to come in very, very handy. <laughs> so have you guys kind of plotted out how you will approach a, a feature maybe documentary yeah um, we're gonna be doing a feature-length documentary we plan to shoot in the fall we've actually already shot a lot of additional interviews um, since that first trip people have been coming out of the woodwork um, who've been connected to Baldwin's grandfather um, but more importantly what we didn't get to do this is only about a 13 minute short and you know we did pack a lot in there but there's so much more history that people don't know and also just the whole immigration um, of how Baldwin's father came to this country. It's partly heart wrenching because um, we touch upon the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which was a you know a nationally enacted um, law that prohibited uh, the Chinese initially from coming to this country um, and restricted them and, and becoming citizens as well. Um, and it, later on, it was expanded to include um, all Asian countries. Um, and so I don't think people in this country or even myself really understood the ramifications of what that law did. And you know what it did was separate a lot of families um, and um, from you know legally you know reuniting and also just the fact that um, Baldwin's father's story is very compelling so we're gonna start in San Francisco um, talking about Angel Island and talking about the immigrants there and then journey over to Mississippi and also covering more about what it was like in the segregated South. I think when, again, we talk about the segregated South, we normally think in terms of black and white. And yet here were the Chinese that were you know, right stuck in the middle. And, and not only the Chinese, there was actually Lebanese there, there was Italians, and at, at that time, I think Italians were considered, you know, minorities. And so, um, and, and the Jewish population as well. And so there was a lot of other ethnicities that served an important part of um, the community, especially the Chinese. Um, they were also excluded from schools, white schools, just like the blacks were. And so um, we, there was a lot of interesting racial dynamics, because in some sense, the Chinese almost served as a go-between between the black and the white community, because um, with the grocery store owners, which we explore, which is what Baldwin's grandfather was, a gro grocery store owners, they were able to serve the black um, customers when a lot of white stores refused to serve the blacks. So there's a lot of interesting race, racial dynamics that we haven't explored and, and just, just, just so many different things about the family too that we've uncovered. Do you mind if I ask then 
the, I mean, the step up, this is your directorial debut, but yeah. then this will be your feature <laughs> director. I mean, this is a big step for you career-wise in making another journey because you guys have established yourself in the music side of things so Right, well. right. Yeah, I think for the film, I mean, it, it crossed our mind whether or not we were going to hire another director to do it. Um, you know, we are going to be bringing on a cinematographer um, and some other crew, but um, at the end of the day, when we thought about it, you know, I kind of had an idea of where I wanted to take the story um, and some of the things that um, you know, I wanted to say and tell, and I thought it was just better for me to take those reins. But it is a larger undertaking. It's it's going to be you know sixty to eighty minutes. Um, our goal is really lofty. I mean, we would like to make an Oscar caliber you know film, but you know ultimately we'd like to be it. We we're programming it to be on. PBS. So, um, just because of the historical and cultural nature of it, um, I think it's a good fit. We you know we'll, we're, our short will be shown already. So, um, it is. It's a big journey. It's a large undertaking. I'm trying not to be overwhelmed by it. Thanks, Scotty, for making me feel overwhelmed. I'm just going to go weep in the corner now. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about fun times with this. Being able to to have already screened it for audiences that have, have really loved mm -hmm. it and bringing it to a Dallas audience that has a very diverse Asian mm -hmm. culture here. Um, can you talk about being able to, to bring it to AFFD? Yeah, I'm, this is our Southwest debut. In the program it says Dallas, but it's actually our Southwestern debut because we haven't been to Texas yet or Arizona or New Mexico. <laughs> so um, we're very excited because we know every region's different. And, and we also know that there's a lot of people from the Delta area that, that also immigrated, well, I wouldn't say immigrated, but like migrated over to Texas. Um, they left Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas and came out this way. Um, so, you know, we are, we're very interested to see this is also the South, a different part of the South and to see how people, you know, respond to it. Um, ultimately, though, I think, you know, the story is an American story and it's about how you find your family and how you connect with it. And so hopefully we'll continue to inspire um, more audiences to seek out their own roots and seek out their own history and contribute to the history of this country beyond just what we read in, in history books. Wow, fascinating. I'm, I'm kind of curious then... Um how much has Baldwin changed because of this experience? In, in, I mean, you're there with him. Right. I think with him, um, you know, one of the things, as mentioned earlier, his relationship with his father has gotten a little bit better. I think also, and I, I would say both of us feel this way, I feel more compelled to, to speak up about, I think, our history, especially from an Asian um, American standpoint. Um, prior to this, I was in ignorant California. I was born and raised in LA. My parents came over from China um, when they were, at, you know, in the in the 1960s for like school, and I just never really not ne never really thought twice about it. And you know, all I knew about the Chinese in this country were railroads and gold mines, probably what most people know. Um, and then for me, when I stepped over to Mississippi, being the ignorant California, I'm like, there are Chinese people here, a lot of them, and they all speak with a southern accent. I mean, I know there's people here in Texas that are Chinese or Korean, American, or, you know, others that speak with, a, you know, a, 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 a Texan accent. Um, but it was just, it, it blew me away. And so initially we thought, we'll just enter a few film festivals and that's it. Um, this was really about our family making a film for our daughter and then once we realized we had a bigger responsibility we we wanted to enter more film festivals and we are now doing more screenings of the film across the country we just got back from New York and Pennsylvania doing some screenings um, and it, it, we've been having full houses and these are free screenings uh, that people are coming from all over to, to see and um, Baldwin and I just felt like we need to let people know this message and hopefully inspire others to tell their stories because ours is just one ours is just one but if we don't tell the story through media, you know, or, or even be able to influence, you know, history books, um, then we're doing our, 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 gen, our next generation a disservice because they're only going to think our country is like a narrow window, you know, culturally. But there's so many people here. There's so much diversity here that I feel like my husband, especially, he feels more American than he's ever been wow. because, you know, growing up, he thought he was the first one born here. And that's probably still true, but he wasn't 
the first generation. I mean, his, his father wasn't the first generation that there was multiple generations that came before him and like, you know, as, as early as the, you know, the 1800s and like we as a culture have as much ownership as the next person that's non-Asian, you know what I mean? So I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is a lot of, you know, more recent immigrants from Asia, like they don't feel like they're included in the conversation in America a lot of times. And so I think for us, we want to help, you know, everyone feel included in the conversation. Have you been bitten by the filmmaking bug? Do you want to keep doing this? I do. Um, even though I'm, you know, I'm a musician still, that's my first love. Um, I through this process and in covering other stories I actually have ideas for other screenplays for narrative um, films um, and other projects as well so hopefully this isn't just a you know a, a one you know one and done type of thing you know besides the second documentary I mean there's a lot of other stories to tell where um, you know meeting fascinating people where like their whole life story could be a documentary or that could be a feature film and, and so I definitely want to keep going um, whether it's from the directing point or producing you know we actually just launched a new multimedia company called you know giant flashlight media so out of this to make the second film so we'll see where it goes can you talk about the empowerment of more and more female filmmakers taking not just you know features but we're seeing them in all avenues short film documentary they're are so many talented women that are finally starting to get um, out there. And it, it, it's not that we haven't had them in the past, they just haven't right. been showcased. Yeah, I think that's one thing, you know, the whole Hollywood diversity, you know, issue has been in the forefront since, you know, hashtag Oscar so white, but I mean, it should have been also Oscar so male too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and being both minority and female, you know, I, I definitely feel very minority. <laughs> I am a double minority. Uh, so, I think it's great that females are, are starting to come to the forefront and it really takes a change at the top too in terms of studio executives taking that chance on you know women filmmakers I think we, we, we present a very different point of view and in some ways like you can kind of see it even I think in the way that I told the story and and why I, I ended up assuming the reins to this film where we had two guys initially like working on the documentary the first cut and I looked at it and I'm like this is not the story that should be told because that's not what I experienced. And it was not that guys aren't emotional and can't, you know, do weepy movies. You know, I mean, Steven Spielberg made me cry in E.T. and a lot of other movies, Schindler's List and, you know, The Color Purple. But, you know, I think women bring a, a certain type of empathy and they bring a different viewpoint than than men. I mean, they can do action too, Catherine Bigelow, you know, <laughs> so um, she's, she's my hero, Oscar winner. Um, so I think we need more Catherine Bigelows. We need more, um, you know, Jennifer you who did the Kung Fu Panda movies just signed on to do some major, you know, films and I think it's starting to happen a little bit more, you know, Ava DuVernay, you know, she's she's getting, you know, uh, more more films under her belt and I, I think it just, it just, we just need to do more. There just needs to be more of us doing it and I think when we make quality films, people will notice. What is it like being able to gear a film thinking of like a PBS audience mm -hmm. and the fact that it's that's so diverse but it's also very specific in the way you want to tell the story right I think with PBS theirs is obviously it's a it's public it's it's educational that's kind of their their tenant and so you have to have those educational you know elements in terms of his you know history or you know regional I, I, and that and that's what our film you know has inherently in it built into the story because um, you know you have certain documentaries that are also about you know slice of life or or a one person's journey and and that can also be educational to whether you know they're they're Cambodian you know genocide survivors or um, they're you know Holocaust survivors uh, um, and there's there's a story behind everything but certainly with with PBS they they tend to be very regional very educational historically um, and and that's kind of what we what we expect to do with our film um, we're not going to be a film that's um, just you know, a zeitgeisty, for lack of a better word, <laughs> you know, um, it's not going to be the, you know, the, the Edward Snowden, Snowden like documentary or, or anything like that. Um, it, it's definitely going to cover a lot more, um, you know, history. So where does the film go from here? What's the next few steps for Finding Cleveland? And then obviously to, to jump into the feature realm, can you give us anything more on, on where that's going to come from? Yeah, for Finding Cleveland, um, the, the short, uh, we are actually doing 
things called the Finding Cleveland Experience, where we're actually touring the whole country in different cities where um, we, we do some music, we present the film and we're doing discussions, uh, and we're doing these at museums, we're doing them at churches, at universities, uh, different places are hosting these, and really it is to be able to educate the public on, on, on the subject of, of, of what it means to be American and uh, how there's this rich fabric uh, of immigrants that came to another region that you never would have imagined in Mississippi. Um, and also, you know, having this dialogue about race relations, especially in this current climate. And, and hopefully, more than anything, I mean, obviously this country has had some bad history in race relations, but we want to be hopeful about it where we're talking about the reconciliation aspect and how the Chinese especially, they were also discriminated against, but they didn't let that hold them back. They were, they, they in turn, became successful business people, entrepreneurs, uh, despite the trying circumstances, you know, and a lot of them and their children ended up going to universities and, and, and getting a college education to become doctors and lawyers and engineers. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's ultimately a success story. So we're touring doing that. We're fundraising for a film. So if anybody watching is interested <laughs> in contributing to the longer documentary, um, it's, you know, our website's findingcleveland.com. So we are starting, uh, we'll be launching a crowdfunding campaign, you know, soon for that. We've already been doing some private, you know, fundraisers um, to make that longer doc. Um, and of course, we're going to go back to Mississippi to film and we're going to go back, to, uh, we're going to go up to San Francisco to film. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to show where the, where a lot of the immigration started um, where with, with Baldwin's dad and uh, hopefully we'll get more stories out of him. He's um, he's already told me some very very amazing stories. If like people think they're going to be, they're already crying at the end of this film. Um, I I can confidently say there's going to be some other tissue moments in the in the longer doc. Wow. Yeah. This is there's a lot of emotion behind this. There is. I mean, people joke with us. It's like, oh, you should have, you know, supplied tissues. And they, they're like, it's a documentary. Most people don't expect, especially subject matter. Like, there's certain things like, you know, again, like Holocaust survivors or, you know, people who battle cancer. Like, those type of documentaries, you expect to go in crying, right? But we're like, Chinese in Mississippi. Like, people just don't think you're going to, you know, get weepy-eyed by the end. Um, and so we we plan, I think, I think that what people have responded to is that emotional element um, more than anything. I mean, I mean, the historical stuff is great, but at the end of the day, it's the heart of, of the film and the personal family journey that that everybody goes through that I think people relate to. And so the same thing will happen in the longer documentary. We just have some other compelling stories. A lot of people have been asking us, it's like, how can you even make this better or how can you even expand on this? And and I, I can confidently say after doing you know additional interviews that there is a lot more story to tell. <laughs> I can confidently say that. So I hope people will be interested to, to, to see that. Well, I'm really excited to see what AFFD audiences will feel. Um, I know I was personally blown away. I didn't, like you said, I didn't go into an expecting that type of emotion. And you guys have made something that's really special and unique, something that you would never expect. So, Larissa, thank you for coming to Dallas. Thank you for bringing the film here. And yeah, I can't wait to see the long feature version eventually. It should be special. Well, thanks, Scotty, for having us. Awesome. And now you can go in the corner and cry. I can go in the corner and cry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks.